we're on the right front side of the 844 where we're looking at the valve chest and the cylinder and these brass castings up there are known as terminal checks and it's simply a check valve for the valve oil that's inserted under high pressure injected into this various steam spaces that need to be lubricated the reason they need to be lubricated with under that those conditions they use a special oil when you consider the steam locomotive what makes it powerful is the temperature of the superheated steam the steam goes through a process known as superheating and it brings that temperature up to, in, in some cases, 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, that's a tremendously hot gas. And so that requires very special lubrication that can survive and endure that tremendously hot environment inside here. We've got some inspection plugs that we can take out and we can look in there from time to time and make sure that we don't have any situations or conditions with the uh, oil breaking down. We can actually see the valve rings and the cylinder down here when you take this this cover off you can see a really industrial looking that it looks like a giant manhole cover with a tremendous bolt circle. We take that off and then you can see the end of the piston and that's when we discover the broken rings. We could also tell just through a loss of performance because the, uh, the rings being broken allowed that steam to blow by. Down below we have cylinder cocks and the cylinder cocks on a steam locomotive are very, very critical. Water does not compress. Steam, of course, will. And when the locomotive is starting out, you can see just some condensate and that's condensed steam returning back to water and it brings with it a small amount of that valve oil. As the locomotive cools off, the valve oil congeals because it's very, very thick and then you just have the, the nice clean water coming out of there. When we start out in the morning, the locomotive has a lot of condensate in the superheaters and all up in the throttle header and you've got to get that water out. So that's why when we start out in the morning you see it's just a big voluminous clouds of steam coming out and getting all that condensate out, clearing it all out in the morning. Same thing with the whistle. The whistle kind of has a, a real raspy sound to it because it's just full of water. But eventually once that the locomotive begins operating and it doesn't take very long, that superheated steam begins to heat everything up and clear everything out and you can hear that whistle for miles. And we use the whistle to communicate like all locomotives do. We use a few extra whistle signals on our crew. Uh, we're kind of nostalgic I guess you could say. They're still in the rule book. Uh, you know, call for signals four. We whistle in our flagman five. Uh, the standard road crossing too long is a short and a long, a warning a long and a short acknowledgement to, you know, all of those various things. But uh, when you consider when you're going down the track and, and in, in any given day, we've got hundreds, in some cases, of railroad crossings that were required, just like any other train, to blow the whistle for. So that's a lot of pulling that whistle. We like how it sounds, the public likes how it sounds, but we try to be pretty disciplined about it, especially when we're in a big city like this. You know, it does hurt people's ears, but uh, they love to hear it. When we get the pressure up in a little bit, we'll blow it periodically. We have air pumps here. These are called cross compound air compressors. We have two. and. Attached to each one is a lubricator with a special air cylinder oil and a specially formulated steam cylinder oil. On our locomotive we use two types of valve oil and it's that specially formulated oil that can endure the, the steam environment. The steam oil in here is too thick to operate in the air pump. It doesn't give us good lubrication so we have another formulated oil that's not quite as thick in here and we have a very nice grade of air cylinder oil that takes care of all the valves and the rings and the discharge valves and the air compressor and it eventually works its way down the air piping to the air brake system and it's all beneficial to the air brake system. We took all the piping off the locomotive. You can see all the piping here is, is clean. A lot of the piping was just deteriorated and just through years and years of service has just been destroyed. So we took and we replaced a lot of this piping in here. So we get up in here, this is the valve gear. This is what controls the valve, the, uh, the steam valve on the locomotive. It does it through all this complex machinery right in here. A piston connected to the crosshead, and that's where the power of the piston is transmitted into the main rod and ultimately into the main pin and connected to the rest of the drivers with the connecting rods. You can see the underside of locomotives just coated with oil. 
The locomotive uses what's known as a waste lubrication, meaning that the locomotive, the oil is used once, maybe twice, before it, it flings off or drips on the ground. And that was just part of the evolution of the design of the steam locomotive. A modern, modern machines, modern engines have enclosed crankcases, and the oil is filtered and recirculated back through the system, and it uses or loses very little oil. But a steam locomotive is not that way. So throughout the day, we'll go through and we'll wash it up and clean it up a little bit. You can always tell the fall season because we'll have leaves stuck all over the underside of the locomotive. This is called the reverse gear. This controls the forward and reverse connected to a reach rod back to the cab that allows the, the engineer to put the locomotive in forward and reverse and all positions in between. You can see underneath here, all new running board with the holes in it, all new piping and conduits and everything was new. The piping was just rotten and destroyed. So we replaced all that piping. This is an air filter here. We took this air filter out and it looked like something that came from the Jurassic period. It was just completely encrusted in rust and it was amazing that the air could even flow through it. So we actually installed a special race car filter in here that we can change as required by federal law. Working back through the cab, back toward the cab, you can see all the pipes and everything that back in early June were, were stripped from the locomotive. New brackets and new piping. And you can see how the front part of the combustion chamber on the firebox gets coated with grease and oil. So does, on the engineer, his right side is color covered with oil, and the fireman, his left side is coated with oil. And here's the firebox, you can hear the fire burning, and down below, you can see the burner. And you can hear the atomizer atomizing the oil as it's burning in the firebox. We put a new fire pan in the locomotive. You can see just a little bit of leakage right here. Again, all of these were rebuilt. New valves, everything inside, new seats, new seating surface where it attaches into the boiler, new studs here. All of these rivets from here all the way around to the other side, all new. All these stay bolts from here up to here. And the firebox sheet on the inside, all replaced. New washout plugs, no leakage, just very tight, all brand new machined, new fire pan. You can see very little signs of leakage. It takes a lot of work when you do that level of firebox work. Install the rivet and then work a process known as caulking, which you use a special tool that forms the two metal together into a nice steam tight fit. Same thing around each one of these stay bolts. Each one of these stay bolts is worked by hand with an air gun and a special tool that we made. We made all of our own tooling, or we had it made in some cases, but oftentimes we'll, we'll have the tools made with special tool steel to the Union Pacific drawing, and then we can grind them and customize them just a little bit, because each person has their own particular technique. Once you de uh, determine how the stay bolt is installed, you design them or you, you install them in such a way as they're all done in the same way. But there is a little bit of finesse to it, and you can tell who did these. On this side, I did all of these. And on the inside, Austin did all the ones on the inside. And you can tell the difference between the ones I did and the ones he did. And we each had tools that we ground and made them the way we wanted. Uh, each one, there's actually multiple steps in the process, but each one of these, you're probably looking overall time between the two of us, probably 20 minutes. I mean, and it, it is arduous, grueling work, which is why the Boilermakers have always been known to be just a hardy, tough group, because I'm here to tell you, driving these rivets, uh, that's not for the faint of heart. You have to use what's known as a 90 gun. I mean, it's a, it's a huge gun. I was a machine gunner in the military back in my early years, in my early 20s, and I'm here to tell you a 90 gun beats me up more than the M60 machine gun did. And the M60 was a 25 pound machine gun, and that 90 gun, every time you would do it, 
after you do a few of them, you'd kind of relax a little bit, but there was a little bit of adrenaline because your body was preparing for what you was about to have to endure. And you had to hold the tool in such a way so you wouldn't ruin the rivet. Because if you damage the rivet or you don't drive it correctly and it doesn't form correctly, we got to take it out because it's not going to work good. It's going to leak all the time and it's not holding the metal the way you want it to. So we, there were several of them when we were first, we, we actually built a fixture that we could practice on. Because we didn't want to practice on this. But even after practicing, there was a couple of them that uh, the, the tool would slip off and then the rivet would cool and it was too cool to drive. And we'd have to drive it out. There was a couple of them, took us over an hour to beat that thing back out of there. So, yep. Everybody that's working on the engine today will hang their identification tag. And we made those special, they're custom. Uh, other, other locomotive shops you'll find a plastic laminated identifi identification tag that all employees are required to hang on the blue flag. It's a railroad rule when they're, whenever they're working on that piece of equipment. So as everybody comes up and their duties require them to actually start working on the engine, they'll tag up. And you'll see that when we stop. Every community that we come in, people will come up, all the staff will come up, and they'll toss up their tags to me, and I'll hang them on the flag. And then as their duties are finished, and they're, they're either going to get in a vehicle and drive with us, or they're going to go back, get back on the train, they'll come, and I'll unclip their tag and hand it to them.